Frontline is a presentation of the Documentary Consortium. I am what a child molester looks like. I am what a serial killer looks like. Tonight on Frontline, a disturbing journey inside the minds and souls of violent sexual offenders. I don't know if I have any feelings. Maybe, maybe that's my birth defect. I wasn't, ever, I wasn't even born with feelings. I don't know. Because I've never felt anything about anything. Correspondent Al Austin examines how one state is trying to stop sexual predators. There's clearly sex offenders who are treatable. And I think there's clearly sex offenders who are not treatable. And the trick is figuring out which is which. Tonight on Frontline, what's to be done with the monsters among us? With funding provided by the financial support of viewers like you. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Frontline. Richland, Washington, halfway between Seattle and Idaho on the Columbia River, is one of those towns people refer to as a good place to grow up in. An ordinary town. But people here, like people in other peaceful places, have learned to listen for sounds other than childish laughter. Learned to fear their parks and playgrounds and parking lots and homes. Because something happened in Richland that happens in many good places to grow up in. A monster grew up here. In September 1989, two young boys disappeared, riding their bikes in a Vancouver, Washington park. They were found later in the day, stabbed to death. Justin last saw his little brother. The following here month, a four-year-old boy Canada disappeared from a nearby Tom playground. Came right to this spot. His body was found three days later beside a Vancouver lake. Two weeks after that, a child began screaming in this movie theater. A man was trying to kidnap him. The man was arrested. He was 28-year-old Wesley Dodd of Richland. He confessed to murdering the three children. He said he had hoped to kill many more. That was three years ago. Wesley Dodd changed the way a lot of people in the state of Washington think about sex crimes, forced them to confront difficult questions. How was this monster created? How could we have stopped him? How can we stop any of them? We had come to Washington and to the penitentiary at Walla Walla, hoping Dodd himself might help answer the questions. It's a maximum security prison with 1,600 inmates. A few are kept in a special intensive security building. Twelve of them are awaiting execution. But even here on death row, Wesley Dodd is special. In a 15-year career, by his own estimate, he molested more than a hundred children before killing three. The most startling thing about Wesley Dodd is how ordinary he seems. Small and harmless looking. The handcuffs seem unnecessary. He speaks in a matter-of-fact voice about unspeakable things. You must have discovered something about yourself in the last two years that you've been in here. What is it? What should people know about you? I don't know. I can't really say I really discovered much about myself. Uh,
I think really the, the biggest thing is that everything could have been prevented. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got, I've had so many contacts with police and confessed to so many crimes and never been charged or charges was dropped. I was never prosecuted for one reason or other. I first started exposing myself when I was 13 years old. My first contact with police came when I was 15. On uh, March 10th of 1977, I was arrested by the Richland Police Department here in Washington. Uh, I confessed to six or seven different crimes. I couldn't remember for sure. So these seven cases probably involved close to 20 kids. For 30 minutes, Dodd described molesting children they, they from one end of the state to another, getting caught, confessing, yeah. and walking away a free man. He said he should have been in prison in four different places at the time he was killing the three little boys. The story was absurd, blaming his murders on those who failed to stop him. And it was hard to believe that so many authorities had let him get away. They suggested that I get counseling, but didn't think anything was serious enough to press charges. And that was it, it was dropped. But we retraced his 15-year trail of abused kids and discovered that he was telling the truth. In his early 20s, Dodd had moved to Lewiston, Idaho, just across the border from Washington. He molested a little boy there several times on both sides of the state line. He confessed to it in both states. Idaho sentenced me to 10 years in prison, but the sentence was commuted to one year in the county jail, and I served only four months of that. So I did four months of a 10-year sentence. Um, everybody over there, is pointing fingers at each other. The judge is saying, well, he made such a good impression. I, I can recall he made a good appearance in court. Uh, he was a kind of a humble kid, and he appeared to be a reasonably bright kid. Judge John Maynard is retired Horton, now. Barton, he is haunted by the Wesley Dodd ways. case. Sure that he says he can't understand how it happened, how he let such a man go. Did you know that he was a repeated offender? No, that was not in his pre-sentence information. Why? I have no idea. Nothing in there to indicate that he had a real serious problem. How could they have missed Dodd's problem? He had been caught all around the state of Washington molesting kids. The Navy had even found out about him and discharged him. Now, can I get the criminal record of Wesley Dodd but Judge Maynard was right, partly. Only a fraction of Dodd's record was reported to him before the sentencing. Even so, that report is full of warnings that something was seriously wrong with Wesley Dodd. A sex crime against another child two years earlier. The arrest for indecent liberties in the neighboring town. Counseling for molesting a boy seven years earlier in Richland. Unsuccessful counseling because Dodd failed to show up for his appointments. One of Dodd's therapists worked just a block away from the courthouse. I had a, a gut feeling. I thought this person was capable of escalating his behaviors. But Psychologist no Steve Lindsley had treated Dodd for an earlier sex crime and dropped him for non-attendance. Now he was appointed to treat him again. Dodd says Lindsley realized how dangerous he was, but still no one did anything to stop him. He says you predicted he might commit murder. In treatment, I did mention to him that I felt that he was capable of doing those kind of things with the idea that he needed to take these things serious. Dodd should have been arrested again the moment he was released from the Idaho jail. Arrested and taken to this courthouse on the Washington side of the state line. Rise, please. Judge John Lydon was the county prosecutor then. Court is in session. You may be seated. A memo from his staff alerted him that Dodd should be picked up and prosecuted for molesting the boy in Washington. Lydon admits he should have done that, but he didn't. He says he doesn't know why. He says the case just got lost in the shuffle. Free again, Dodd headed west for Seattle. 
moved to Seattle on June 13th, 1987. I tried to kidnap a boy. My intentions at that point were to kidnap him, to rape him, and to kill him so that he couldn't report me. I was, this boy knew what to do. He knew something was wrong, he wouldn't go with me, and, and he made an excuse to leave the area, and he went home. He was able to identify me, and I was arrested that night. Well, I wrote when I filed the case on this guy, locked this guy up forever. Rebecca Rowe, head of a special team that prosecutes sex crimes in Seattle, has bitter memories of Wesley Dodd. What happened to him here? Why do you only get 118 days? Um, essentially a interpretation, in my view, a hyper-technical interpretation of the statute by a judge who made a finding on a reduced charge. It was never, um, you know, it was never negotiated or plea bargained. We filed attempted kidnap one on him, which was the top charge we could file, and made a recommendation of a lot of time in prison, and a judge made a decision that was the judge's decision. You saw him as dangerous? From day one. You only had to read his confession to know, you know, he confessed in our case and he said what he was, what his intent was and he outlined the length of time that he had had this, uh, you know, this problem and, uh, you know, I, I don't think it took a rocket scientist to figure out he was dangerous. Um, was found guilty of attempted unlawful detainment. I had already been in jail by the time I got to sentencing for that, I'd already been in jail for 118 days, which is beyond what they normally give for that kind of a crime. So I was released. And I remember just being sick when our judge, who it's, you know, I'm just, is a good, thoughtful judge who was making a legal decision that I'm sure he felt, you know, he had to make. I didn't agree with it. I don't always agree with judges. But it just made me sick. The judge, Stephen Riley, has retired. He declined comment. After that, Dodd says, his sexual fantasies and his plans merged. He would murder his victims to avoid arrest. And the prospect of murder became exciting. And I, I just became completely obsessed with it. That's all I thought about 24 hours a day. I, I was dreaming about it at night, uh, constantly all day at work. That's all I thought about was killing kids. The story of what happened in the autumn of 1989 can be found in a vault of the state Supreme Court in Olympia, Washington. A box of evidence. There is no way to prepare for the horror contained in that box. Let me know when you're finished. Okay, thanks a lot. some standard police photos of crime scenes. The lakeside where one body was found. The park where Dodd found two boys, molested one, and stabbed both to death. His home where he killed a four-year-old boy. The theater where he tried to grab another victim and was caught. And there are diaries, meticulous handwritten notes and diagrams as Dodd planned and carried out the murders. He wrote of a wounded child pleading, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, before Dodd stabbed him again. Another entry says, I think I got more of a high out of killing than molesting. And I must find another child. his briefcase with the next child's underpants. And finally, a little photo album Dodd kept of that killing. 
the four-year-old named Lee, kidnapped from a park and taken to Dodd's home. You kept a photo album. Why? Two reasons, really. One was to help me remember what I'd done, exactly what had happened, what he looked like, uh, for my own, you know, pleasure. And we'll get photos later on. And another one was, so the next time I got a boy home, I could show him pictures of Lee hanging in the closet, and then I'd kill that boy. Wesley Dodd told police the murder of four-year-old Lee Isley was sexually motivated. Dodd's murders were part of a siege of sadistic crimes in Washington, committed by men who had repeatedly been caught, jailed, treated, and released. Experts say they're frustrated because the problem doesn't seem to be going away. A state known for progressive methods of controlling sex offenders was now full of furious citizens demanding protection from men like Wesley Dodd. How many more violent criminals has the state put into our midst? How come these guys can plea bargain on this? Who's pleading for the kids? What about the ones that aren't prosecuted? No more plea bargain. Washington's legislature agreed. Not only ordering longer prison terms for sex offenders, but passing a drastic new measure called the sexual predator law, intended to stop the most dangerous men before they become Wesley Dodds. But who are those men? There are plenty to choose from. Washington's prisons hold 2,000 sex criminals, and several times that number have served their time and been set free. These men are preparing for release from prison. Uh, molested and raped uh, three and 12 year old boys. Oral rape to bestiality. I'm a sadistic rapist. Um, I like to hurt them more than I actually like to rape them. To the untrained ear, the men in this group sound at least as dangerous as Wesley Dodd before he committed murder. There's a part of me that's still laughing. Yeah, Tell that. us about that. Yeah. Joseph is due to get out next year. It just, part of me just doesn't want to give up the deviance. It doesn't want to give up. It holds on to a piece of it. It doesn't care. I have 60 victims. Mike has been in prison for more than two years. He is scheduled for release in just a few weeks. I've been involved in three gang rapes. Um, I've raped and attempted rapes on females. Uh, my age range is 4 to 11 year old boys and girls and 12 and up females uh, to adult women. Uh, he looks like anything but a rapist. An ordinary looking young man like Wesley Dodd. Unlike Dodd, Mike hasn't killed anyone. He says his violent behavior stemmed from abuse he suffered as a child. I lived a lot of uh, a fantasy fantasy world from the time I was five, six, you know, I had imaginary friends, people that liked me. And when my world was disrupted, I would get angry. You know, Mike remembers walking alone when, when he was 15, stairs, encountering a girl was, walking toward him, you know, punching her in the face and raping her okay. for no other reason than that she was there and he was feeling so, bad. Um, I knew it was wrong. I didn't care was around the fact that I was in denial about... All these men are due to be released soon. But now, under Washington's new sexual predator law, a sex criminal may not win freedom, even by serving his full prison sentence. I'm a sadistic rapist. Any one of these men could be tried again, not for what he's done, but for what he may do, and be locked up until he proves he's no longer dangerous. We're all sex offenders. 
We all have similar traits and similar... But with the defense expert, I'm able to offer her... Critics went before Washington's Supreme Court, claiming that the law will mean life in prison for crimes not yet committed. We can now infer future crime. Why? Because the person's committed the crime in the past. It is circularity in the worst sort. Ten men had already been brought to trial as sexual predators. All ten were found guilty. They were taken to a special commitment center at the Monroe Reformatory, a maximum security unit capable of holding a few dozen sex criminals Washington decides are the most dangerous of all. We went there to meet the next man the state wanted to commit as a sexual predator. His record lists him as rebellious, incorrigible, with signs of sadism and pedophilia. Even the psychologist hired by his attorney said he probably fits the legal definition of sexual predator. His name is Joel. He's 23. He has served prison terms for having intercourse with a teenage girl and for a drunken fight with two men in which he evidently used a stop sign as a weapon. At age 16, he raped a 13-year-old boy, paused when the police arrived, then raped the boy again when they left. He has a record of assaults, arson, auto theft, and sexual misconduct dating back to the age of five. In the last 10 years, he has been free a total of five months. What do you think? Are you a sexual predator? No. In my opinion, a predator is somebody that you know, sneaks around and, and pounces on their victims, you know, preys on them or stalks them or whatever, you know. I'm not like that. Joel says he learned very early to mix anger, violence, and sex. I knew what sex was before I even knew what, what I was, you know. It was always dirty. And in my, in my home back then, things felt filthy, you know, felt dirty all the time. When I was about seven years old, I was babysitting a younger, a younger child, and uh, this, this kid made me mad, and I hit him. And then once I hit him, you know, he, he started crying. And I hit him again, and, and I got pleasure. I didn't get, I, it was like I looked down on him and, and I seen how innocent he looked, and how he, you know, he wanted me to stop. And it seemed like, the act of making up to him and making him feel better what felt good. Not the act of beating on him, but the act of making up to him. And then I had the feeling that that was the same feeling my stepdad was getting from me. It was he'd beat on me and beat on me and beat on me. And then after it was over, he'd make up to me. And then all of a sudden, he'd see how much I admire him. I don't have the slightest idea why he did what he did. I don't have the slightest idea. Hanging around with the wrong crowd when he was younger, I don't know. Joel's stepfather, Leonard, was mildly surprised to hear that Joel was about to stand trial as a sexual predator and might be locked up for life. He didn't seem interested in attending the trial. You haven't been to see Joel since he's uh, been up at uh, Monroe? Hmm. I don't like to drive much. Spent seven years on them semis going up and down the road and the highway and stuff, and I just, just I'm going to drive. It's just a storm back. <laughs> I've had my fair share of the road. Had Leonard beaten up Joel? Well, not exactly. Oh, I bopped him once in a while when he was younger, but, <laughs> you know, straighten your act up, bud, you know. But, hell, I bopped him around once in a while. Did it straighten you out? Did it? <laughs> Did it hurt? <laughs> Only your pride, huh? Anyway, when he was at home, him and his brother fought all the time. And I mean, they fought rough. Piece of rubber hose, anything that was laying there, they'd grab it up and work each other over with it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, matter of fact, one time her mother hollered at me about it one time. They was out in the yard and they was going at it. And I think Sean ended up with a bloody nose. And Joe had a cut lip and one of them had a black eye or something. And 
Margaret hollered at me. She says, Leonard, why don't you break them up? And I said, well, it's a rough world out there, and if they're going to learn how to get survive in it, let them go. <laughs> you know? Leonard used to um, convince the kids by offering them a quarter to uh, get into fights, him and his brother, to see who could beat up who. Joel's and mother was camera shy and would only talk by phone. She said she wouldn't be visiting Joel either. Do you think he ought to get out? Do I think Joel ought to get out? Yeah. No, absolutely not. My personal opinion is this. Joel got himself into it. Let him get himself out. I, I have Her attitude has always been, even when I was a little kid, it's your own fault. You know, you take care of yourself. That's the attitude. And when she writes me here... Everyone liked Joel. He had a neat smile, um, freckles on his face, um, big, thick, heavy uh, head of hair. Everyone really liked the kid. Paul Batzel was Joel's counselor at St. Helens Elementary School in Longview, Washington. It's the only school in town that didn't kick him out, Joel says. A special room. We could stand up on this little box and look out over the playground and watch Joel in action. And he would be doing very well for a period of time, and then all of a sudden he'd explode. And Did you ever learn why? Well, in part, uh, abuse. We wondered about abuse. And I can remember one time when I met with, uh, with the mother, and we had sensed that there were marks on his body, and, but didn't know exactly why they were there. Batsoul never did find out. Neither Joel nor his mother would talk about it. This is one but he did get Joel to draw a picture of his family. He did this one at 11 years of age, and he portrayed his family uh, with his brothers, age 12 and 5, and then his sister, who was 14, and she was smaller. And then the last drawing that he portrayed himself was as age 11, as being the smallest of the entire group. Very impersonal, no interaction. Um, it's like ducks in a row. Um, it's just a bunch of people living together in an environment, nothing happening. Is that a sad picture to you? Yeah, especially for a child who's 11. It's a story that I would look at a family and I'd kind of wonder what, would, what goes on when the doors are closed. They lived here for a while, near the junkyard. Joel has forgotten his other homes, or they've been torn down. When welfare agents came to check on him, Joel ran away from them. Later, he would claim that his home was full of all kinds of abuse. Authorities never were able to prove exactly what was going on, but they were sure that all the children in the family were being neglected and were running wild. I indicate in my report that they had they missed at least half of the school year and that had been going on for a couple of years uh, bringing the problem to the mother's attention nothing was done she was not getting up to see that, that the kids uh, were being fed uh, uh, and off to school caseworker Dan O'Neill wrote in his report that unless the county stepped in he believed Joel's situation would continue to deteriorate So I filed a dependency petition and in the petition, I requested that Joel be removed from the family home and be placed in foster care. And I guess the court felt that the, the home situation was not as bad as it appeared to me and to school personnel, and so they left the child in the home. Just as O'Neill predicted, Joel's behavior grew worse. The childish explosions became crimes, and juvenile authorities arrested him. We, for the most part, uh, unfortunately, never really got a chance to work with Joel. He uh, shot through the department uh, one offense after the other. and They put um, him on probation for arson and burglary. But within days, he'd committed another burglary, stolen a car, and molested a child. It became quite apparent early on that Joel wasn't just another kid going through the system, that he was... Uh, Hell bent, if you will, to commit, continue to commit crime. Uh, don't hop like that, they'll take that by And so, at age 13, Joel was shackled like this boy and was on his way to a juvenile prison, Echo Glen. They put me in a van, a transportation van with cuffs and shackles on, and it took us like five hours to get there, four or five hours to get there. And the whole time there, the guy that was sitting next to me was telling me, you know, that when you go in there, you're going to get raped and, you know, people are going to take advantage of you. Uh, they, uh, you go to school together. All the way up there, I was, I was scared to death. And when I finally got there, I was paranoid. 
You know, I won't even go to the bathroom without, peek, you know, going in there and peeking around, making sure no one was hiding. And I felt like, man, my mom knew I was coming to this miserable place and she didn't warn me. You know, she didn't tell me about it. She didn't say goodbye to me or anything. And in a sense, I, I honestly felt like, like doing more wrong to get back at them for punishing me for my first wrong. He tried to get back at them by stealing from the staff, fighting, and engaging in sex with other boys, lying, and wrecking a truck trying to escape, almost killing a child in the process. At age 16, finally freed from juvenile detention, it was only two weeks before he did something worse, brutally raped a 13-year-old boy. That, that wasn't something that I plotted. I didn't go out on the streets and roam around for days and look for a victim. It just, he was there, I was there, and boom, it happened, you know? And I did it, well, see, it started out as, as an act of beating somebody up. It was a fight at first. You know, it was a it was a one on one fight. But then boy when when I got controlled, I guess I just went overboard. So, you know, it's not an act of sex. Um I urinated on him, you know. At at that time I, I guess when it was over I didn't feel like I was superior, but at the when I was doing it I felt like, you know, I'm disgracing this person, you know. It probably is too late for him to uh, turn out to be a normal, pro-social kind of person who goes to college and succeeds in life. Brett Trowbridge is the psychologist hired by Joel's lawyer to evaluate him. Certainly he wouldn't be in the very worst category, but I would guess that technically he would fit their uh, legal definition of someone who's likely to commit predatory sex offenses in the future. Is he unusual? In your experience? I don't think so. I think that this is a kind of a run-of-the-mill uh, type of person that I see at least in my practice very frequently who has been in trouble all his life from early teenage years mostly because of serious family problems and uh, drug and alcohol problems and gets in trouble with the law and stays in trouble with the law through throughout his youth and early adulthood. I think there's a lot of Joels out there. A lot of Joels. A lot of potential Wesley Dodds. But is one like the other? I don't see no no similarities between me and him because he claims he has, he has raped over a couple hundred people, you know. I'm not like that. It's, that's that's not my, my thing. Like I said, I'm you know, I've been a criminal. Wesley Dodd was different from Joel. Dodd wasn't abused at home. He says the worst thing that happened to him was having to change clothes in front of an aunt. When the Dodds lived in Richland, their home was close to a grade school and a playground. Ordinary home, ordinary childhood, ordinary family. The family has quit talking about him publicly. They've agreed it'll be better after he's been executed. His parents fought a lot and finally divorced about the time Wesley began molesting kids. You heard criticism when he did something wrong, but there was never any praise, there was never any love, no, no hugs. I don't remember dad really ever playing any games with us kids. I was 11, 12 years old. I remember sitting down as a family and playing Monopoly, and then it ended up with mom and dad screaming and yelling at each other about who owed who money. Dodd lived his first dozen years without leaving a trace. His memories lead through a kind of void. No happiness, no sorrow, no friends, no desire to have friends. Just suddenly at age 13, and urge to expose himself to passing children.
By the time he reached high school, Dodd was molesting children regularly. He says he had no idea how to talk to a girl his own age. He didn't talk to boys much either, because all his thoughts were secrets. Yearbook pictures don't show how withdrawn he had become. He was an average student. He joined the drama class and played clarinet in the marching band. Well, I had him as a student at Chief Joe Junior High through his junior high years. And when he got into high school, he came back under a serve program where students could come back and work in classrooms. And I had him the three years then. The one thing about him is that he always told the truth. He was just very quiet. You had to draw things out of him. But uh, he was extremely reliable, very responsible. And then I knew I could rely on him if I asked him to get something done. It was guaranteed to be done and done right and done well. I knew that the family life wasn't good because <laughs> I just kind of, you know, kids don't always come out and say that, but you can just kind of gather it when they don't, parents don't come to their concerts or show much interest in the They didn't kids. come to his? No. Is there any sign at all that here was a dangerous kid? None. Because I'd had him to my house even. And uh, he even stopped back in and visited. And, and then I, had, I got married and had kids. And he came. And then that was the last time I, that he even came by the house right after, after I had kids. Yeah. But you, uh, it, from, I would have let him babysit him. I mean, you know. In his senior year, there are no pictures of Dodd. It's as if he was disappearing as a student, as an ordinary boy, as the other side of him took over. Things just gradually progressed. Like I say, well, I started exposing myself when I was 13. Uh, after a while, that wasn't any fun anymore. I needed some physical contact. So I started tricking kids into touching me. That wasn't any fun anymore, so I started molesting kids. Uh, things just gradually progressed, got a little bit more serious and increased in frequency. Uh, and one thing wasn't exciting anymore. I had to do something else to, to get that old feeling of excitement back. But why? Where had the addiction started? What was it Wesley Dodd had become? No one has struggled with those questions more than Seattle psychologist Kenneth Von Cleve. The Seattle judge who put Dodd on probation after only 118 days in jail assigned Dr. Von Cleve to evaluate and treat him. It was two years before the murders. Von Cleve warned that Dodd should be hospitalized for his pedophilia, but didn't see him as violent. My impression with him at the time I evaluated him that he was he, he was incapable of murdering these little victims that he loved and looked to for the only source of intimacy that he experienced. That was my impression. I thought a lot about that. How could this, my impression of this person, been wrong to the extent that he was this dangerous? And I, uh, I realized probably now more fully I've had a direct experience of that, that, that psychologists and psychiatrists cannot predict this kind of behavior. I think and yet, Von Cleve thinks he understands Dodd. To a point. Push. Yeah. Von Cleve himself had been a thug as a young man, looking for recognition and power, he says. Instead, it won him 13 years in prison for armed robbery. In desperation, he began to learn, finished high school, earned a bachelor's degree, a master's, and a doctorate in psychology, all while he was in prison. All of it a need to be somebody, to stop feeling bad. I know what it's like to feel like slime, to a point. Uh, with Wesley Allen Dodd, I, I don't, I'm gonna tell you, I don't have any, I have never felt as bad as he likely felt most of his life. 
I don't, uh, but, I, but I do understand that that's the driving force in this violent criminal behavior against other people. All his other relationships uh, would unravel and deteriorate. He just was not able to participate in a meaningful adult relationship. And in some uh, kind of a, a twisted manner, through his offending, he was able to achieve some levels of intimacy. And I, I imagine it was done with the little boys because it was safe. He was in control. He got to be the powerful person. The problem is that every time he did that, I think he worsened his problem. And in that way, he disintegrated into the person he is today. Dr. Von Cleve thinks no one will ever find the one key event in Wesley Dodd's life that would explain his horrible transformation from child to monster. He thinks there is nothing to be found. Here's a human being that grew up with a hole in his soul, so to speak, unfulfilled. I don't know if I have any feelings. I don't think any, I mean, uh, may, maybe that's my birth defect. I wasn't ever, I wasn't even born with feelings. I don't know. Because I've never felt anything about anything. You can look back and see some, in some cases, causes. But the really frightening cases are there are a fair number of cases that come through here where you have people that are child molesters for really no apparent reason in their background. So there may be a lot of Wesley Dodds or potential Wesley Dodds out there. There definitely are. What about all the other potential Dodds and Joels? The thousands of other sex criminals? What do we do about them? Let's well, not candy coat in here. Let's get the crap done. I don't like being in a place like this. I don't like what about men like Mike, who admits he had had no feelings for the 60 women and children he hurt? Mike and the 200 others in this prison wing are voluntarily undergoing treatment as the last step before they're free. Just figured that she was trash. Uh, I was doing society a favor by uh, shooting her. How many people who are here are in your program? Barbara Schwartz is a pioneer in the treatment uh, of sex offenders. 200 with another... The program she had run here for the past three years is the nation's largest and uses methods ranging from old-fashioned to bizarre. Here? This is a physiological assessment lab. This is a machine called the penile plethysmograph, which allows us to directly measure the level of a person's sexual preference. Um, it uses a small gauge that's attached to the shaft of the penis. Get under the sheet, and I'll hand you the gauge, and you put it on, and we'll take it from there, okay? Schwartz well, concedes that she and others who ventured into this strange new field are only beginning to discover what works, you know, that there is no on, cure. The way we talked about. Seth? Yeah. We're not going to find the truth about something as complicated as sexual assault in this society, we're going to find a lot of different little truths. Don't talk back to me. I'm not being a brat. Don't, don't talk to him that way. Oh, David. don't tell me you're not you're a kid. You're just a little kid. You know it. He's such a brat. No, you up and through the wall. Wall. no, I'm not going to let you. Yes, sir. No, their pain. Their pain. Get away. Their pain. Show me their pain. John Bergman is a former actor and drama teacher. Now he coaches sex criminals in reenacting their crimes, makes them play the parts of their own victims, breaks them down in hopes of making them think. Here are these people who make hell to victims, and on the other side, these human beings who we can get to and who have this raging hell inside them. We're seeing a really interesting process where we're working very hard on getting these guys to understand the, both the pain that they've caused others and because of that a way for them to discover how not to go and hurt again come on bitch get down on your knees bitch sexual offending is about secrecy it's about hiding it's about uh, about keeping something furtive inside come your on, head bitch. and the more furtive it is the more excitement there is the question is to what degree they've internalized it. This is why drama therapy goes this hard. Maybe you ain't such a stone bitch after all. 
It's crazy. This is why it's this painful and sometimes this brutal. Because it needs to be in there as big and as large as all that old stuff which they've supported for years and years and years. Uh 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 uh. The job isn't over just lying there. Come on. Got work to do. Come. Mike says that this sort of thing has changed him, forced him to see himself for what he is. There's a real nice looking guy that, that's very well read and, and speaks well uh, to get in and get what he wants. You know, and then I can turn into this other guy. The monster. Right. What makes you think that this new improved mic will transfer to the outside? It's gonna be tough. Uh, I, I'm getting pretty short. Uh, getting ready to get to work release and my fear as a fear you know I have I have a, a history of being incarcerated in county jail and uh, every time I got out there was the new improved mic he was gonna do it better he wasn't gonna mess up you know he wasn't coming back and within two to four hours after I got out I was always back into my old stuff drinking getting high you know doing whatever Mike believes that if he is to have any chance of controlling himself, he must give up hope of a normal life. I can't go out with anybody that has children. I can't be around children. <clears throat> uh, I can't be around teenagers. You know, I just, I can't do that. And, uh... For how long? Forever. But is that possible? How long have you been out? Um, about a year and two weeks. I talked to several graduates of prison treatment programs. They all insisted on being anonymous. And they all said the treatment had worked. But... I need to stay away from... Oh, this is, this is hard. I need to stay away from women or teenage females. There's been probably a dozen times since I've been out that I've had problems with seeing like a teenage girl and wanting to look. Um, I haven't found myself in the situation of running a deviant fantasy as of yet. Mm -hmm. but, but, but what? The urge has been there, you know. That incurable urge, many people believe, makes women and children guinea pigs in a discredited experiment. What do you do? Even the Washington Psychiatric Association claims treatment of sex offenders doesn't work. That's correct. That was our position. That sexual offenses are criminal, uh, uh, is criminal behavior, antisocial behavior, the same as any other criminal behavior, and as such should be punished rather than treated. To put most sex offenders simply in a prison um, may protect the public for the time that they're in there, but it certainly does absolutely nothing to make that individual better, and it does a great deal to just kind of compound their problems. One of every five prison inmates in Washington is here for a sex crime. All but a few, those labeled sexual predators, will be released, with or without treatment, most without. Sex offenders are returned to prison for new crimes at about the same rate as other types of criminals. Other statistics about them, about the effectiveness of treatment, are so contradictory they're used to prove almost anything. That treatment works, that treatment is worthless. I think there's clearly people, there's clearly sex offenders who are treatable. And I think there's clearly sex offenders who are not treatable. And the trick is figuring out which is which. Five months after we first met Mike, he sat waiting in his cell for the prison bus that would return him to freedom. He admitted he was nervous about leaving the security and support he'd gotten used to here. What am I gonna do when I find myself uh, alone? Uh, or when I'm tempted with drugs and alcohol. Uh, 
maybe when I'm turned down for a job the tenth time, or uh, things aren't going the way that I would hope. Relationships with with women worry me. Uh, being intimate, uh, how am I going to approach that? I've never done it on an honest level. I've never been honest with, with in any relationship, and doing it now uh, is scary. If this guy can't tell the truth, and it leads to him reoffending, he'll come back here, and the process begins again. And someone else will have gotten hurt. And someone else will have gotten hurt. And we have to go and do it again because 90% of all offenders in this country go back out into the streets. On August 31st, Mike went free, relying on his two and a half years of experimental therapy to keep the monster inside him bottled up. Everyone else seems to think I can make it, but I believe it. It makes me feel good when I say stuff like that. But uh, when I say these things, I actually believe them, which is a, is a lot further from where I used to be. I'd say it's a safe bet. Joel is left behind. He has waited more than a year for his trial. Warped by the life he had to lead, he might have been rescued when he was still a likable kid. Now he's merely dangerous. All Washington can think of to do about him now is call him a sexual predator and cage him. A person could go insane in here, and I don't want that to happen to me. I'm me, you know, I'm the only person when I die, I'm the only one that's going to be in that coffin. And I don't want to go there insane. I want to go there knowing that, that I did something with my life, you know, that I actually, even if I just rent an apartment and die the next day, it will be the very first rent I ever paid, you know. And I'm sincere about that. Wesley Dodd waits on death row, impatient to die. An invisible man who finally caught our attention by killing children, and now taunts us for failing to see what he was. I am what a child molester looks like. There is no dirty old man. Dirty old man does not exist. I am what a child molester looks like. I am what a serial killer looks like. He seems familiar, yet we don't know him at all. Invited into his mind, we found it impenetrable. Is there something biologically wrong with him? No one has bothered to look. Maybe Washington's new laws will protect the children from the next Wesley Dodd, the next monster, if we can recognize him in time. But we don't know what created him, so we don't know how to prevent the next one. He disgusts us. We look away. We don't want to think about him. We want laws against him. We want simple answers. And maybe there is no such thing.
Funding for Frontline is provided by the financial support of viewers like you and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Two weeks ago, Frontline aired a program called The Best Campaign Money Can Buy. In the course of the broadcast, Frontline reported that ABC News correspondent Sam Donaldson owns an apartment at the Seaview Hotel in Bell Harbor, Florida. In fact, Sam Donaldson does not own and has never owned an apartment at the Seaview. Frontline regrets the error. For video cassette information about this program, please call this toll-free number, 1-800-328-PBS-1. This is PBS.